Hello, come in. Hi, come away and nice to see you again. Well, I've got my lovely um, Dragon's Claw Meerschaum pipe going today. By which you'll be able to tell that I'm in either a Tolkien-esque or an Arthurian mood. And in fact, come over here. Well, of course, there's the last words we saw before, but you may have noticed when we were looking at that that I also had this. Now, this is T.H. White's famous retelling of the Arthurian stories in a sort of modern idiom or with lots of anachronisms, um, but very powerfully, uh, The Once and Future King. And you see the F.S. there, there's the grail. F.S. stands for Folio Society. And it's a beautiful box book. But, you know... Though I could never afford a Folio Society book new, and I don't belong to the Folio Society, the second-hand bookshops in Cambridge, you know, selling effectively estate books, you know, uh, often have whole sections just full of Folio Society books. And I picked this one up, look, £12. I and mean, you can't get a decent paperback for that now. And look at this, it's absolutely lovely. You see how it's the castle, it's Camelot, there's knights over the bridge, there's a couple of knights there. So this one is... There's Arthur and Merlin looking out over the realm. This one, uh, introduction by Kevin Crossley Holland, illustrations by John Lawrence. There's Merlin as he's imagined by T.H. White. Of course... In T.H. White, Merlin is living backwards through time, as it were, and can remember the future but can't see into the past. And, of course, Merlin is therefore full of telling them about things and using images of steam engines and things. But um, it's beautifully laid out. It's all the books. And uh, let's just see if we can come across one or two of the other illustrations. Of course, you never find them when you're... Well, look, there's uh, the feasting and... I love these other pictures around the borders and the motif of the Grail Cup, of course. And there's Wart and Kay, I think. Wart being Arthur's nickname. Anyway, it's a beautiful book. This is another one, let's just see. Well, look, there's Arthur and Guinevere. Anyway, um, so T.H. White retold it in his own way. And um trouble getting it back in now. They're very tight fitting these cases, there we are. You can go in pride of place on the humidor. The only reason I've suddenly come across it, do have a seat, is that um I was gradually having to move everything from my study here and then I put it in the garage first and now I'm going through the books in the garage and there it came but I'm sharing it with you now because um, you may remember do you remember when I um, I read you I sort of had a sudden burst of ballad writing Arthurian ballad writing because I, actually the truth was I was supposed to be spending the day filling in a tax return form and I just couldn't bear to do it so I wanted to procrastinate and I promised to write a, <coughs> a lost tale of Galahad so I made up and told the story I read you of the Ballad of Galahad and the Naiad, which was a story that I added to it, because Mallory, who's the main source for all these things, says, oh, you know, Galahad had various adventures in this wild wood that aren't recorded in any books. So I made that up, but it went so well that it made me think, you know, I could turn my hand, maybe, to telling the main stories, you know, the true, the, the great central stories. And of course, of all those central stories, the story that interests me most in Mallory is the, the story of the quest of the Grail, of the San Grael, and the, the achievement of it. And of course, central to that is the coming of Galahad and um, the whole mystery of uh, his birth and, and um, his taking of the siege perilous and, and so on. So I thought I'd have a go and I've begun to do it and I've written about three parts of it so far. And um, Again, just like T.H. White or anybody else, you take Mallory and then you take a series of hints and clues from Mallory. And, you know, Mallory, Mallory tells us the magical story of how, through an enchantment, um, you know, uh, Galahad was conceived uh, yeah, by the, the fair Elaine, 
Sri Lancelot under an enchantment and uh, then brought up not knowing who his father was in um, in King Pele's castle, which is the Grail Castle, because Pele is his grandfather, but he doesn't know who his father is, and how eventually he's called to the court at Camelot. Indeed, we're told it's Lancelot himself who comes to knight him, not knowing who he is. Um, so there's all that, and I'll be telling that story. But uh, I thought, just rather like T.H. White does a, quite a lot of time, and one of the best bits in The Sword in the Stone is, is the way T.H. White imagines Arthur's childhood. So I thought I'd have a go at imagining Galahad's childhood and this strange Grail castle with the wounded king and and his mother's, you know, uh, wonderful storytelling, but also the mystery of his own origins. But, you know, uh, in some ways, those mysteries of childhood and growing up are, are common to us all. Uh, Anyway, so I thought you might like to hear it. I've just typed it out. I have the book. I'm actually making the, the poem in this manuscript book. And these are all the drafts of it. But my handwriting is so bad I can't, I can't really read it properly. I have to puzzle over it myself. So I've typed out, um, or printed out, just this very first part of uh, what I hope may grow to be a longer thing. And I imagine it as coming out rather like the book I just showed you, as a sort of book that, you know, the, the same kind of children and young people that love to read about Narnia and, Hob and, and The Hobbit and that kind of thing might like. And I would imagine it having lovely illustrations, uh, just uh, uh, like I showed you. So this is the very first part. It's a ballad form. Uh, the whole poem will probably be called, the, called the, the Coming of Galahad or The Tales of Galahad. And this first part is His Childhood. So make yourself comfortable and uh, here we go. When Galahad was still a child, they let him run full free and roam the castle holds and halls and hear the minstrelsy. He played among the dovecotes there and watched the doves take wing and hover o'er the hallows where they hold the holy thing. He played down in the kitchens and the cooks made him good cheer. He watched in wonder by the forge where they made sword and spear. He wished that he might bear a sword and set a spear in rest, as brave and bold as Lancelot, the brightest and the best. He played alike with high and low and put his trust in all. King Pelle's people welcomed him in cottage and in hall. The chapel of the castle keep was more than home to him, and sometimes when the incense burned, his eyes began to swim, and there he heard unearthly song, and strange things came to pass when Galahad was serving at the sacring of the Mass. And sometimes, when the bell was rung, he felt a strong desire, a longing for eternal things, a kindling as the spirit sings, a stirring as the heart takes wings, when poets strike the lyre, and as he yearned, the tapers burned with Pentecostal fire. But not less when he roamed the woods and played at chivalry. For he heard voices on the air and elfin minstrelsy. For he heard voices on the air when in some quiet grove a white dove lit upon the branch and spoke to him of love. For then he sensed the Holy One so present in the mass was present in the growing trees and in the lowly grass. The voice that spoke to him in dreams spoke also in the flowing streams. For sometimes heaven shines and gleams even in things that pass. His mother was the fair Elaine. She set him on her knee and told him all the tales of old of love and chivalry. She told him of his lineage, the kin from whom he came the keepers of a sacred trust, the keepers of the flame. He knew the tales of singing stones, the tales of holy wells. The castle of the wounded king was wound around with spells. And summoned to King Pele's side, sometimes he could divine that it was strange and perilous to come of Pele's line. He knew no earthly father there, but often Elaine's eyes grew misty when in tales she spoke of love and of disguise. He would not probe the mystery he sensed that she concealed. In time, she used to promise him, all things will be revealed. 
Sometimes he longed to be a knight, sometimes to be a priest, sometimes to be the minstrel who makes music at the feast. He asked the lady, fair Elaine, what will become of me? Oh, you will be a knight, my son, the flower of chivalry. So many knights just draw their swords to shed blood on the land and keep a code of chivalry they scarcely understand. But when the sword of destiny is holden in your hand, then you will not bring violence but healing on the land. And then he knew a time would come when he would leave his home, forsaking the familiar roof for heaven's starlit dome. And he would ask Elaine the Fair, when will I be a knight? And she would sigh and say, in time, and hold her young son tight. So that's the end of part one. Maybe when I've written a bit more and um, I'm feeling more assured of it, I can read you some other bits. But um, meantime, uh, thanks for dropping by. I'm off on holiday next week. Uh, Maggie and I uh, are, are having our post-Easter break, so we're going to be away in Norfolk. So I won't be in for our usual couple of weekly sessions next week. But when we get back, you must pop round again and we'll carry on with our conversations and readings. That'd be great. Every blessing. Good to see you.